Hi, my name is Hannah Crawford and my pronouns are she, her. And my name is Simi J. Patoka and my pronouns are they, them. And we are... The Dreaming Divas! <laughs> we are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And it is our goal to create a similar platform from the perspective of young singers. And today we had the pleasure of chatting with composer Matthew Emery. We talked uh, really in depth about his composing process, the commissioning process, and where to find poetry, and much more. It was an incredible interview. You really should check it out. But before you do, we'd like to graciously acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendaki, Neon, Winseo, and neutral people. We seek reindigenization. We stand with the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We are grateful to be working and learning on and about this land. We honor these communities as traditional stewards of these lands. Be sure to check out the podcast. It's a really, really fantastic one. And don't forget to subscribe. Click the link below. Ding! Ding! <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today. We're really excited to speak to you. We've never had a guest who's a composer, so this is very exciting. Yeah. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, uh, if you're all set, we'll start off with your land acknowledgement. Yeah, I'm a settler. I'm a composer and an artist currently living on Treaty 2 lands. That's the traditional lands of the Mississauga, the Attawadirondack, and the Anishinaabe Waki. And I'm grateful um, for their curation of the lands while I'm a guest here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Hannah, right, take it away. So we always, we always torture our guests with a 60 second life story. <laughs> Torture is not actually real, but um, we always love to just hear if you can fit it in. Um, everybody seems to do it with, but it's okay if you go over. So don't worry. Okay. And so just tell me, can you see this? Hold on. Everyone's texting me at the same time, of course, right? So popular. <laughs> Are you uh, ready? Yeah, I can see it. Great. So I'm, I'm Matthew. Um, I'm a composer. I grew up in London, Ontario, and I grew up singing in a choir for um, treble voices. And then I graduated to sing tenor and bass. Um, I played piano, the French horn, the cello, all throughout elementary school and high school. And then I went into music at the University of British Columbia. Um, then I took a year off and I lived in New York and studied with a composer there. Um, and then I did my graduate, both my master's and my doctorate at the University of Toronto. And now currently, um, because of COVID, I'm living on an onion farm, um, but I'm teaching at Carleton University um, through the magic of Zoom technology. And um, yeah, that's basically it. And I got it in under the minute. Nice, wow. good job. Six seconds to spare. That was actually so well done. It was very calm and you managed to fit in so much. It was very well done. <laughs> Thanks. Usually we get a lot of like, um, um. <laughs> so you're a composer, but you, you grew up uh, playing all of these super fantastic instruments. What led to wanting to compose music? Yeah, you know, my, my, my upbringing was musical and my family was very musical. All of um, well, my parents are, are musicians and my grandparents are artists and my aunts and uncles are involved in the theater. And so I guess being a composer was just sort of my way of finding a place. Um, I grew up in choir and I loved and still love singing. Um, but, you know, giving an art song recital or, or, in, or singing in my private lessons, I wasn't finding my voice. That That wasn't like ah, this is what I need to do. This is not how, um, you know, I make sense of the world. This is not, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't my, my vehicle for expression. And it wasn't until I was um, 16 or 17 and I was just bored of practicing the same piano things. And at, sometimes I was bored in band um, or I was bored in choir. And I'm like, why did this composer pick this note? Or what happens if I just hold on and I don't resolve this suspension? And then I would do it and the teachers would say, oh, there's something funny in the French horns. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm holding that over. Sorry, it sounds cool. And um, then that was like, ah, maybe there's something here. And, and I started writing out just chords, like pages and pages of, of cool chords and 
they were basically like species counterpoint. If there's any music theory people listening. Um, and, and then I started figuring out, ah, this is cool. I can say something this way. Um, and then um, my, my choir teacher said, why don't you put words to that? And it was sort of the snowball effect of being bored and exploring to, oh, I should write this down. Oh, I should find a poem. And then it was, ah, you know, what poem can I find that expresses this feeling or this idea that I want to speak about um, and then combining it all. So that's the long answer. The short answer is composing is how, yeah, I find my place in the world, how I make meaning, how I connect things that I want to connect and explore. That's so cool. So uh, it's so interesting because I, when I um, talk to other composers who write um, vocal music or choral music, a lot I would say the vast majority of them base the music off of the text. But you kind of find a text that matches your music. Is that part of how your process works uh, throughout your composing process? Yeah, I mean every piece is different. Um... Sometimes the, the music comes first and then I'm finding a poem that fits that image or that atmosphere I'm creating. Um, and sometimes, yeah, if I have a poem like, you know, on my piano right here, um, then the poem will inspire the music and I'll, I'll go that way. And then sometimes it's a bit of both. I, I have the melody that's, you know, floating around, but it's not, you know, it's not for a specific piece just yet. And there's my dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I compose it sort of each at a time and I'm, I'm writing the melody. I think, ah, oh, what poem can fit that? And then I search for the poem. And then um, maybe then once I have a short list of poems that maybe fit that melody, I then change the melody. And so every piece is a bit different. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Interesting. And so when you're, when you're composing, um, regardless of if you're starting with uh, text or without, how, how uh, does your process go? Like, where do you start from? Uh, and then how do the details get added in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, um, it's usually a process of, there's something I wanna say or I'm feeling and trying to express that usually with harmony, sometimes with, with rhythms or, or even structures and the form of the piece maybe interacts that way, but, but usually it's, it's a chord or a chord progression. And then that's sort of like the cell or you know, the thing that the piece is built out of, the roots of the piece. And then I, I usually just improvise. Most of my writing is intuitive. Um, you know, composers sometimes are, we, we give ourselves limitations or restrictions. I'm only gonna write in a certain meter or I'm only gonna write in A major. Um, sometimes those are helpful, but for me, everything is, is usually pretty just intuitive and I write what I think sounds good in the moment. And then um, hours, days, weeks later, when I'm revising and editing, I may go back and, and tweak some things, but, but usually it's just an improvisation, um, usually at the piano. Um, I like writing at the piano because I get to hear it right away. There are, um, well, lots of pieces, not, not my art songs so much, but a lot of my a cappella choral music, I wrote away from the piano just um, purely because at, at music school as a composer, I was not given access to a piano um, as often as say piano players were. So I didn't always have access to a piano. Um, so that was good for a technical exercise of writing away from the piano. But now that I have a piano, it's usually just improvising and thinking, ah, that really works. And then there's like adrenaline that you get or, or like the thrill of inspiration to quote whoever that was, Stephen Schwartz or Sondheim who said that. Um, but then it's like this energy that I have to chase and I write it as long as I can. And sometimes it's for 10 minutes and sometimes it's like I can write for four hours straight. Um, and I, I write everything by hand um, at the piano on manuscript first. And it's just pages of, of chords and melodies and uh, rhythms, texture. Sometimes I'm just squiggling out like blocks and shapes. It's like, okay, I know this is what I want it to sound like. And then how do I get to this other spot? Um, and it's just a process like that. Sometimes I, I, I tell my students, it's like um, we're a gardener and we're shaping the yard. We're going to put these flowers here and this is the path and we're going to pull that out. And, um, or it's a sculptor and we're, we're shaping like with clay. And it's this, this process of, of small revisions that then build up to you know, a full piece. Um, 
I think that's the process overall. The, the TLDR is it just starts as an improvising mm -hmm. and I go from there. Obviously, um, some pieces have, a, have restrictions like it's for a, a tenor and a piano. And so the piano only has so many notes and the tenor usually only has so many notes. Um, and then there's a text and the text is so long and I can either obey that and um, set it sort of you know, traditionally, or I can disobey that text and cut it up and splice it up and repeat things. Um, so sometimes the material that I'm working with will inspire that piece um, in, a, in a multiple of ways, um, but sometimes not. Wow, okay, that's so cool. And you were talking about, um, you had, uh, for a moment you, you spoke about inspiration. Do you um, find that the inspiration comes from when you're sitting at the piano or is, are there outside factors that kind of spark something in you and you get a new idea? Generally, it's outside factors. It's, um, you know, the way the, the sun reflections will reflect on my print or on my bookcase and then I'll have shadows on, you know, mm -hmm. the couch or the floor. And then it's like, ah, what? what is that feeling? What is that, ex what's that expressing? If, you know, the reflection of the light could express something. Um, or like the past two years, I've had a lot of COVID commissions. Um, and, and so the various feelings, you know, of, of the whole spectrum of, of, of what that has brought um, can influence the piece. And that can be the inspiration. If there's a text, usually that's the main inspiration, the imagery, uh, what the poet is saying. Um, but I also have a lot of music that's inspired by architecture and the way that we're shaped by cities, by buildings, the traffic, the density of the streets, um, how, yeah, how we are shaped and how we shape the place that we live in. Um, and it's been interesting, you know, since moving here, sort of in the middle of farmland, from living in downtown Toronto, like in the heart of it, how that's influenced different pieces of mine. And um, it's cool. I, I'm starting to write a bit about it, sort of like as in an essay and see, you know, what, what can I get from these experiences and how have I been shaped on a different level other than just my music by the places I've lived in. Very cool. Wow. So, so when you mentioned, like you've obviously, you're, you've had quite a few commissions during COVID, which is so amazing that you've, like had the opportunity to even have work which is amazing yeah. so congratulations um yeah. would you say that depending on the commission is it more collaborative or do they give you most of the control or does it depend on the person yeah it depends um some composers work well if you know to put it bluntly they just give them money and they say i need a piece in six months see you um, and I've had that, um, but I've also had very successful commissions where the commissioner was very involved. And like, I was having daily phone calls with, with them about what the text should be. Um, and even like, you know, we want this type of a poet and this type of a poem, and it needs to begin with this type of a word. Um, and, and that fit into this, the concert's longer narrative of all of these pieces working together. And so that was very involved. Um, Usually, the more involved the commissioner is, I say usually in quotes, um, the, sometimes the composer will feel more restricted and um, mm. it, it doesn't work as well. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, and I've had that happen on, on two or three times, um, but it, I've also had it the other way where the, the commissioner or the conductor has been super involved and it worked out really well. Um, I'm pretty easygoing, I think. So I'm game for, for whatever, you know, it's um, while I write the music myself, I mean, it doesn't come to life until somebody plays it or sings it. Um, and so it is a collaborative process. Um, the one thing COVID really disrupted was people singing my music. I, I mean, obviously, because we weren't allowed to. Um, and so on one aspect, you know, things didn't change for me because I still had commissions um, coming in from like a year or two ago and so that process didn't change but the timeline of people to sing it the, when the choirs could sing it has all been changed so I had about a year or two of I had commissions but nobody was singing and like my room was silent um, and that's hard because yeah I sit in my studio writing alone um, but usually I get to hear it 
you know, within a few months of sending it off to the performers. But here I've, I'm having premieres now from pieces that I gave choirs in late 2018, mm. um, 2019. Um, so it's like two or three or four years of me waiting to hear some of this music. And that's been really hard. Um, of course, I'm grateful that I have performances and I have commissions because there's lots of composers who don't. Um, so it's a little selfish of me to say that, but that's how that process has been for me is waiting that collaborative process of bringing that piece to life going to the rehearsals going to the concert um, and hearing it outside of my head um, that's been a slower process mm -hmm. and would you say like you gave the timeline of six months but for different commissions what's the kind of timeline you usually get i've had as short as two weeks oh my gosh <laughs> One of my most performed pieces was, was that story. I got a call like on a Wednesday and the conductor said, hey, um, we want a commission. It needs to be, you know, this type of a piece, which was SATB acapella, three minutes on a reflective theme, which is like my bread and butter. I love writing yeah. those. That's the poetry I love the most. Um, but then the conductor said, yeah, but I need it in like 10 days. <laughs> <Good>. uh, <laughs> So that was short, but then like that restriction was great because I, well, one, they paid me up front, which was nice. So money is always an incentive, is a good incentive for the composer. Um, but then it was like, I could free up my schedule and I had that tight deadline. Like they were singing this on a Monday afternoon, you know, in Kitchener and they needed, they needed that music. And so th that pressure was good. And it was one of these stories where I opened up one of these poetry books um, literally to the page and the poem I had to edit one word um, and luckily this poet is in public domain so I can change the word without too much issue um, uh, so I changed one word and the piece wrote itself in an afternoon and then I, I sat on it for a few days um, but it was just one of those that I think that the timeline the tight pressure um, it was a it was a pretty well-known group so there was like a prestige to it and everything just sort of clicked. Some commissions, um, I ask for like a year or more, um, depending on if I'm if I'm teaching or you know a few years ago when I was a student, if I had to defend my thesis or you know we had end of term stuff, I'd ask for more time. Um, but usually, I, I have like a six or eight month window. People will email me in January and say I wanted a piece for September, or they'll email me in September and say I want something for my June concert. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah for me I write quite quickly and I write every day um, I always tell my students if you're going to be a composer you have to treat it as if you were you know a soprano or a pianist or an oboist you have to practice every day otherwise you know you lose your your craft and your skill and so for composers it's the same yes usually the best pieces come when inspiration strikes um, but there's a whole school of com of composers who take the approach that I do. I don't wait for inspiration. I go to my desk or my piano and I compose. And eventually that inspiration will come. Um, it may mean I have two or three pages of mediocre music, but then I put that away and come back to it. And maybe those mediocre chords today are the perfect chords for a piece next year. And I've had that happen a lot. I never erase anything. Um, of course, I write everything by hand, as I said. So a lot of composers now write on the computer. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I have everything I've ever written. You know, there's a big box in my parents' basement of, <laughs> of literally everything I've ever written because I don't use an eraser. I just move, you know, if I'm writing, I just flip the page or I scratch it out or I put a big X through it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't erase it so I can come back. Um, and sometimes that saved me on some commissions. I didn't know what to do. And then I just go back a few pages on my piano and say, ah, there's something there on November 5th that will work perfectly. Um, yeah, so the process is, every piece is different um, and I write quickly. Um, but yeah, I like to have six or eight months if there's any commissioners listening. Um, <laughs> and then some pieces, I mean, if, you know, if, if I wrote a big um, choir and orchestra piece a few years ago and, and that one, I like to have more time just because it takes longer to orchestrate. Um, assigning what instrument will play what and where. And, um, but if it's an art song or a choral piece that's, you know, three or four minutes long, I can probably write the majority of it in a week or two. 
Um, but then I like to have another week or two or four to make sure that it's perfect. I sit with it. I played at different tempos. I played in different keys. I played in reverse. Uh, you know, I play backwards and see, oh, does this still work? Does it not work? Sometimes I find something really cool or I find a big mistake. I, I once, um, I'm rambling now, but I once forgot a line in a poem and I didn't realize I'd forgotten that line until I played it backwards. And I was looking at it, you know, I, I had it on the piano and I had the poem here and I'm like, wait, I didn't set that word. And I thought, wait, I didn't set, oh my goodness, I forgot an entire line. Um, and so if, I think if I hadn't played my piece backwards, like at the piano, then I may not have seen that. Um, yeah. Interesting. Oh, this is so cool. So, um, and we don't have to leave this in, but I, I'm really curious. So if you were to have to compose SATB for like a three minute piece, what would you charge for such a commission? Yeah, there's um, suggested rates. Uh, we can leave this in. There's suggested rates by the Canadian League of Composers. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and they have um, a set rate. So I think the current rate is um, for a, a, an a cappella choir piece under eight minutes is $508 per minute of music. So a three minute piece would be just over $1,500. Um, I charge more than the CLC rate, um, depending on my schedule the timing. So sometimes I've charged double or triple that, um, just the, depending on what the schedule is like and what, what the piece is. Um, but yeah, as a general, the Canadian League of Composers has a set rate for pretty much every instrumentation from a unison piece for flute all the way up to, you know, a full length opera. Um, and those are the suggested minimums that you should be budgeting for. That's so, I didn't know that existed at all. And it me put a link in the description so that we can find that. <laughs> yes, that's a really good resource for everybody to know. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So now, so p let's let's pretend piece is finished. We want to publish it, and I know you work with a few publishing companies exclusively. But when you were first starting to, you know, get your work out there, how did you know how to choose which company was right for you? Yeah, you know, that's one of the, the hot topics for composers is mm -hmm. publisher, self-publishing. Do you just give the music away for free? Um, do you, if you're going to self-publish, do you just sell it as an individual score or do you sell it at a higher rate and say, mm -hmm. this is your score, your license, your approval to upload and record? Um, when, still to this day, and when I was starting out, I would send music to publishers whose music sounded like mine. Um, and so when I was at UBC, um, my professor, Stephen Chapman, was published with a, uh, a company in um, Massachusetts, E.C. Shermer. And so I sent my music to them. And um, they turned the first four or five or 10 pieces I sent them down. But um, mm -hmm. now they have um, seven or eight pieces of mine in their series. Um, I sent music uh, to a publisher in Los Angeles, Pavan, um, and they were one of the first people to sign me on and say, yeah, we'll publish your music. And they publish music mainly for um, educational purposes and for schools. And so the music had to be accessible, um, meaning and really logistical, you know, like talk, like it had to be in 4-4 four, four or 3-4. It had to be in a key signature with four or less sharps or flats. Um, so there's all these sort of technical things that can factor in where you send your music that is not that creative to talk about, but it's sort of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and so if I have a piece that's in D flat major, I may have to choose which publisher is going to publish it. Otherwise, it may not sell as well. Um, and of course, that opens up a can of worms of do I want to sell my music? And is, if I'm selling music, is that too easy? And there's sort of all these academic things that can come into it. But I would, I would pick the publisher based on what music they were publishing and if mine was similar to it. Um, you know, there's, there's choral publishers that publish a lot of folk song material. There's publishers that specialize in music for professional choirs and universities. And so I'll send my music that's more difficult to them. Um, and it's sort of a long process to figure that out. And it's always changing too. And publishing in itself is tricky because 
they only have so many pieces that they publish every year. And so if I'm an undergrad student at UBC who's written a three minute piece that any choir could sing, um, that, that helps me. And I'm Canadian that helps me because American publishers think, ah, that's exotic, a young Canadian composer, let's do that piece. Um, but then I'm competing against every other composer there is and like well-known composers and um, famous composers and my own professors. And so if they only have 30 pieces a year, let's say that they publish like um, Pavan Publishing, the one in Los Angeles, that's how many they publish every year. It's a set number. Um, and so of that 30, you know, 10 of them will be for SATB choir. And so they only have 10 and they may have, well, I know they have about two or 300 pieces a year that get sent to them from composers that they've already signed like myself. And we have to then like battle it out of which one of us is gonna get one of those 10 slots. And so it can be just as simple as, ah, that text um, is, um, we've had too many people setting Sarah Teasdale. So we love your piece, but no, we need a non Sarah Teasdale. And that can be it. It's not even, we don't like your music. We don't think it's beautiful. It's a simple like business decision. And still to this day, that's hard for me to take and learn because I don't want my music to not be heard or not be published and sent all over the world. And then I get to meet choirs and all that stuff. And that's what the publisher is really good at is sending that all over the world to choirs to universities to libraries um, so that's the tricky part of the publishing um, is is getting it accepted even if you're one of their composers already let alone if you're just um a, an, you know an unsigned composer that's written a piece with a great recording and then you email it to them um, that's tricky too but that's also how i started out is i just sent them to the publishing companies um, and Usually it took like a year for them to get back, but sometimes they took them and sometimes they didn't. And then once you had, you know, two or three published, then it's like a snowball and then you become more of a name. Um, and then eventually editors will start maybe approaching you and say, hey, I'm an editor for Boozy and Hawks. That's how I got in with Boozy and Hawks was my music was being performed a lot in America and at big conventions. And so then they kept seeing my name on programs and then they just reached out and said, hey, we saw that you had this commission from, you know, this, this really well-known choir and conductor. Uh, we were at the concert. We really liked it. You know, we'd like to talk to you. And that's how some publishing things get started is they'll approach you. Um, but that said, I still have pieces turned down by Boozy and Hawks by that same editor who emails me and says, Hey, I want to publish that score. You know, I get emails all the time and said, Nope, for whatever reason, it's too short. It's too long. Don't like the poem don't like the ending, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so that happens to pretty much everybody. Um, there's a few composers where they don't get things turned down, um, but there are a lot of well-known composers I won't name, um, but I know they've had things turned down because at the end of the day, if we're going to go that publishing route, it's a business for them. Um, and that's hard for composers. And I mean, all creatives to have rejection and to have the business, you know, factors factor into our creative creations um, so that's hard and it's still hard for me today um, but it is the route I chose by going with a traditional publisher mm. well I know at Laurier when I was there you were a household favorite just to let <laughs> you know um, but so when I would go to your website so I, I purchased some of your music does Thank that you. benefit you're welcome <laughs> does that benefit you like how does how does contracts work with that yeah, the, the publishers, um, you, you sign a deal and they give you a royalty every time okay. your, music, your music is sold. And then most publishers, um, you keep all of the, well, it depends, but, but usually you'll keep most of the performing royalties. So um, in, in theory, um, not if you're doing a student recital, but if, if you were doing an art song recital mm -hmm. um, at um, a, a place, you would also pay... Um, a fee to perform that music that's not inherent in buying the music you actually are supposed to purchase a few different types of licenses which allow you to perform it um, and also record it and then also record it and upload it and so mm -hmm. all of those fees add up and they get sent to the composer as well um, but yeah if i get more money if i self-publish for sure of course uh, yeah. um, but yeah if you buy it with a publisher you get a royalty and then um 
all of those performance royalties, most of them come to the composer. The mm -hmm. publisher doesn't keep all of that. Yeah, Laurier, I'm, I'm so grateful for, I mean, for the singers there um, and all of the, the collaborative artists who, who, mm -hmm. who play my music at Laurier. Lots of, uh, Laurier is like one of like the, the schools that's always performing my music. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so grateful to, to Laurier for encouraging, you know, Canadian composers and living composers. Agreed. I've had, um, well, I won't say, I mean, people can Google. I, well, I went to U of T and I went to UBC and, and one of those schools, um, I ran into an issue once because there was a, a student recital um, and they didn't want the student to play all of the pieces we proposed because it would have been too Canadian. Hmm. It's like, now this was, you know, 10, 10 years ago now, but it's like, that's so weird. Yeah. Um, but Laurier is always singing my music, so. I think Leslie, Leslie Fagan and Kim Barber are all like a huge fan too. So they're like, sing it, do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so, I mean, it's nice. Again, I'm, it's sort of, not a lot of composers get repeat performances of their music. And so I'm grateful and humbled that so many people sing my, my music and still sing it and find it meaningful and relevant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's technical reasons why. I'm writing music that you know is singable and has that accessibility as an aim or an ideal. Not that my music, my art songs are totally easy. There's a lot of really tricky things in them, mm -hmm. um, but I think you know that's. I write music that I want to hear first and that I believe in, and if that means the majority of undergraduate singers can sing it and tackle it and find something in it to build towards and perform well, then that's a benefit. I think that's perfect for me. Um, right. Some composers don't want that. They only want to write music for the very top elite um, performers and audience members. Um, and it's hard to listen to. It's hard to perform. It's, it's hard to make sense of. And then that will limit the amount of performances and audiences that you get. Um, that's totally fine. Um, but, you know, I grew up in the community choir. I grew up in community bands. Um, I had great public education you know, like I had music class from kindergarten to grade 12. Um, and so I think all of that factors in that I just want music to be accessible and, uh, you know, creates a community. And so I want to write music that people can use. Um, so I think part of that factors into I've had a lot of, a lot of people can sing my music and they can perform it. Um, but yeah, Laurier is like number one school performing my music. I'm so grateful. <laughs> At least we're Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> So um, we've talked a lot about uh, vocal music, which is, you know, kind of our shebang because we're both singers. But mm -hmm. um, when you also compose um, orchestral music and have done some choral and orchestral together, what would you say, um, is there a different approach when you are uh, composing vocal or choral music to orchestral? There's, there's a different approach in that if there's a text or not, um, so if it's a purely instrumental work, um, there's no text that guides me immediately. You know, even the way a poem, I don't have one handy, but, <laughs> but I mean, I, I do have a poetry handy. Um, you know, even the way it can just, I mean, who knows if we can see this, but the way it's structured on the page, mm -hmm. you know, this is a single line and then a short and a long, those things can influence the composer versus if it's just um, pure text like prose, um, that's in like, um, you know, four line stanzas and then there's three stanzas and, or, or if it's a sonnet or all of those things of the structure of the poem can influence the music, the form, the shape, the tempo even. Um, so if, if that isn't there and I'm working purely instrumental, then the process changes and it's like, okay, what am I going to do? What is, what, then, and then I go back to, well, what do I want to say? Um, do I want to say anything? Sometimes I don't want to say anything. And I just want just to be a piece that's a meditation on whatever, getting away from the hustle and bustle of downtown Toronto. Um, sometimes if, if it's a purely orchestral piece, the, the Toronto Symphony played one of my pieces called Unanswered Letters. Um, and that title came at the end of the process. The, the beginning process was, how can I structure a piece around a scale and so i had you know half the orchestra play a c major scale starting low and going high 
and the other half starting high, going low. And then at various points, different instruments would hold, you know, um, an E or an F or, or a D. And I'd get all of these really cool chords that I would always use, but done through the orchestra through this idea of ascending and descending scalar patterns. And then that had me thinking about, um, you know, what am I doing here? I'm forgetting some notes, I'm holding on to others. And then it's like, ah, that's like when I don't answer some text messages or I answer some right away, or there's some emails that I forget to answer, or there's some that are still unread from years ago. And it's like all of these things that we prioritize, we make hierarchies about. And then it's like, okay, how does that idea of a hierarchy influence other aspects of my life and what things are said and left unsaid. And then all of this came to fruition and that was the piece. And once all of that, I sorted out my head, I wrote the piece sort of quite quickly um, as I do most of my pieces. Um, but that was the narrative I had to create. And um, so it came from thinking about whatever, just life in general, uh, but there was no poem to guide me. If, if I'm writing a choral orchestral piece, then the text will guide me in some way. But then sometimes I think about instrumental forms, theme and variations, sonata, different types of dances, even things like ternary, ABA or binary, AB, and how that may influence the piece. If I'm writing a big choral, choral orchestral piece, am I going to have an interlude, whether it be a prelude, postlude? Some of those things can factor in. Um, and so then the instrument or the instrumentation will influence the form or the gesture that I write. Um, I had a commission a few years ago and there was no clarinet in the orchestra. It was a, a large orchestra actually. Um, and Leslie Fagan um, was one of the soprano soloists. Um, it was a big piece for a Bach festival. Um, so I had a, a huge choir, um, soloists, um, a children's choir. Um, yeah, I think it was a big choir, children's choir, SATB soloists, and then basically full orchestra, but no clarinet. Um, and so that influenced the piece. Um, and then I've, I've had interviews asking if not using a clarinet was a political statement. And I said, no, was, the commissioners just didn't have clarinet for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> but then that created a cool thing that I had to work out and compose around. It's like the clarinet is, I teach orchestration at Carleton. Um, and I, I sort of say all the time that the clarinet is one of the most important instruments in the orchestra because its range is so large. It plays very low and it can play very high and it blends really well. So it can play you know, low with the cellos, it can play high with piccolo um, and celeste if it wants to. And so it's very versatile. And so not having that clarinet on that piece was tricky, um, but it also then forced me to be creative and inspired other things that I could do. Um, so yeah, if it's, if it's purely instrumental, then sometimes I do a bit more pre-composing and I think, ah, if I don't have a text to guide me, what's the piece going to be about? What form will I use? So I do a bit of pre-composing, but at the end of the day, I just improvise at the piano and I think, okay, what's a cool melody? What's a harmony? Um, maybe if it's just um, an instrumental piece, I'll think more about texture and timbre. You know, the strings can do tremolos or pizzicato, uh, flutter tonguing in the winds, uh, lots of percussion techniques. And there's a timbral aspect that isn't usually used in choral writing, um, or at least I don't use it in choral writing. There are lots of different timbres you can use, but I'm pretty traditional in my choir writing. But with the orchestral, sometimes you can experiment a bit more, or at least I do. Um, so sometimes that, that process changes, but at the heart of it, it's I just write music that I believe in, that I want to hear, and hopefully others do. Um, that, that piece with the TSO has had mixed reviews. Some people love it and some people really don't like it. So interesting. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> I guess so that's like with any, any piece that's in the public, any, yeah. someone's not going to like it. Someone will. And yeah. that's it's like being a singer. <laughs> some people will like you. Some people will hate you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about that as we're talking so much because every uh, it's, 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 um, like people's opinions and and how you view yourself based on what you get what you don't get all that stuff i'm like i never i i do compose a little bit but i'm mainly a singer and i've never really compared the two so much but they are very similar mm -hmm. yeah singing is i mean it's also one of the reasons i didn't want to go to university to be a singer 
I, I applied to most schools as a singer, as a French horn player, um, and as a composer. Um, but with singing, it always felt so personal. It's like, oh, you're flat, you're sharp. That was bad. You could have breathed better. But if it was French horn, I could say, ah, the valve was sticky or, oh, sorry, my, my mouthpiece, whatever. Like I could blame it on something else. But with singing, it's so personal and so connected to like your soul and your physical body. It's, it's tough. I would not want to be a singer. Um, it's, <laughs> it's really hard. hard. It's hard not to take things personal, like when yeah. you're composing too, because like you created that with your own mind and body and it's the same thing with singing whereas like you were saying I, the valve was you know sticky or something you know it's it's so, yeah it's so personal yeah yeah composing is tough because it's like music that you believe in so deeply and somebody else can just say oh why did you write a c major with like you know that's so whatever 1620 why aren't you writing music that sounds like xyz in 2022 I am a personal fan. I love poetry. I love reading it. I love writing it. I just started writing it and not so much in the past, but do you have a specific like book you lean towards or like a genre per se? Like, what do you, how do you, how do you choose all of that? I think if you're going to be a composer who sets text, you have to have that love of poetry. Mm -hmm. I I'm not sure when I realized that I love poetry, but it was probably in, in elementary school, like grade seven or eight. And I just did not like reading. We had to write, read all of these like chapter books and then write essays on them. And I just could never get into them. And then in high school, it was like, I don't know, I, I just couldn't get into it. But then we would have poetry class. And I was like, ah, now this is really cool. You can say so many things with one line, even just a simple image um, that then when you think about it, just reverberates to things you know much further beyond and that did it for me more than chapter books ever did um, and so I read poetry I mean most of these books these top four are all those are my good poetry books um, of, of things that I go to all the time and I'm always reading poetry um, I used to um, search well uh, okay I'll, I'll, I'll go back and say um I like to find poems that work on a lot of different levels. So on, you know, a very, you know, level one, it could just say whatever, um, the sky is dark. And then level two, it combines with something else. And it's like, okay, well then why is the sky dark? And then there's two things talking. And then on the third level, it's like, well, is, are we even talking about dark? Are we even talking about sky? Are we actually talking about, you know, some tragedy? And, and, and then all of these things, you know, interact with each other. And, and poetry is good at doing that. It, pre it presents you with one idea, but it reverberates. Like if you throw, you know, a stick or uh, something in the water and then it, it ripples out beyond. There's all of these different things that connect. And so I look for poems that, that do that, but that do it in a specific way. And I look for poems that have, it, it sounds sort of lame when I say it, but words that are like one and two syllables long. Um, not that I will never find, I'll never set a poem with the word unimaginable in it. Um, but the word unimaginable has a rhythm to it. And it has an inherent meter, I would argue. Um, and if my musical line doesn't fit with that, then I'm stuck. And so if I set poetry that uses words of the everyday, um, so that usually means setting poems that are from 1890 to 1940-ish. By the everyday, I guess I'm meaning almost 100 years ago, but, but words that are of the every, everyday and that present images of the everyday, things that are right outside my window, things about nature, things about human connections. Um, then I can use those and combine them with my music, my harmony, my melody, different phrase lengths, different you know, textures and things like that. Um, more easily. The, the text is more malleable for me if those words are shorter and are more everyday words that we use now. Um, and basically that's, I mean, I was just giving a, a talk to one of my students about this and, and they're um, coming from English as a fourth language and they're really having to, to figure out, you know, the accents of words. Um, and then how those accents fit into a musical line. And do we obey that or do we disobey that? Um, 
one of my composing professors used to say um, sort of provocatively that music is king. Um, and, and when they are composing, their own musical line it would be forced on the poem. Um, so the poem is the source of inspiration, but if you're gonna set the word unimaginable and it requires that you say it in three beats as opposed to five, the music has to win. Um, and so then sometimes that means the text setting is more awkward. Um, and so then I thought, ah, well, that's a good point if I should just find a poem that works right at the beginning. Um, and then I don't have to do these weird maneuvers. And so it works for me if I find texts that are, yeah, 1880, 1890 at the, the oldest end up until, I mean, 19, 1921 or 1940, depending on whose copyright rules we'll go with. Um, and so that's for copyright reasons so that it's in the public domain and I can, I have free permission to set it um, and, and divide it up and cut things out and only set half of it if I want to. Um, but then there's also this language that is a bit older, but, but uses the words that we still use today. If you go too far earlier, you'll get words like doth, which is fine. Nothing against the word doth, but I don't say that in my everyday vernacular versus poets like Marjorie Pickthall, um, Sarah Teasdale, you know, Archibald Lantman, the poems that I always said you know, you could argue that those sound like they were written recently, maybe not in 2022, um, but, but maybe that could be a cool debate. Um, and so, yeah, I like, I like poems that generally are, the syllables are shorter so that I'm free to mold them to my music more easily. I can set um, a one or two syllable word as a melisma um, much more easier than the word unimaginable. That would be hard to sing as a melisma. But, um, oh, cool is the valley now, James Joyce from Chamber Music. Um, those are all one and two syllable words that I can then shape and create a, a line that's very short or a very long one. Um, I look for poems that have lots of vowels, either at the beginning or the end, if I can. And that way I can shorten or lengthen each phrase um, easier. Um, yeah, that, that's basically it. Shorter syllable words I like. Um, I like poetry that talks about human connection, um, nature, um, and then public domain just for selfish composer reasons that I don't have to worry about as many issues with copyright. Um, recently, though, I've said a lot of poetry by living poets. Um, and some of my really dear collaborators are, are poets. Um, and that's always exciting and, and also sort of tricky um, because if there's a word that I want to change, I have to get permission or I should get permission. And then if the poet says, well, no, you know, you, that word is so crucial because X, Y, Z, it's like, ah, okay. So then I need to edit my music. And then that's a true collaborative process, um, which if I have the time um, is great. So if, if I'm setting a poem that's by a living poet, I usually want another month or two um, in my timeline so that I can work that out and we have time to sit and think. Um, if it's a really short deadline, then I'm going to use a poet who's dead so that I can um, have free range on the poem. And um, yeah, I used to search poems by first line. Um, actually, the art songs, the, the three songs that most um, performers um, sing. Um, I found those poems by searching by first line because I first line or last line, um, because I wanted that final or first image to be something that was really inspirational. Um, so that's a cool way if you don't know where to start. There's lots of websites you can search by by line um, or even by first or last word. Sometimes I knew I wanted a piece that started with um, remember, and you can type that in and you'll find all of these poems with the first word remember. Or the opposite, if you want a poem that has the word um, creation or dazzle or blueberry, um, all of those I've searched for, uh, and you can find poems that way. So that's a fun way to do it too. Um, and the last point I think about poetry as I'm talking out loud and rambling is the poetry is, um, I argue, the most important part of that piece. Without the poem, I mean, it's nothing. And so sometimes the it, it takes 90% of that time to find the poem. 
I may be, I may be reading poems for months on end. Um, and then when I find it, like that one commission that I had 10 days, everything just clicks in. And it's like, ah, that's it. Uh, and then the piece writes itself for me quite quickly. And so the takeaway for that is I, if it takes me a month or two or three or four to find the poem, that's okay. I wait until I know it's right for whatever reason I know it, it is right. And then I go with it because there's nothing worse than sitting with a poem that you've turned out not to like after you've agreed to set it or, you know, things change. And it's like, oh, I didn't spend enough time with this poem. Now I don't really like what the poet is saying and the piece is half done. And so that can happen too sometimes, but that's how I look for poems basically, you know. That's cool. And it's so true. I, um, I compose as a hobby and it takes me like quite literally years to do most pieces. But then there was one uh, time where a friend of mine on Facebook, she posts her poetry on Facebook and I saw this one poem and I read through it and like the, the, I finished composing it in 24 hours. It was fantastic. Yeah, that's so exciting when that happens. Yeah, I want it to happen more. It's way more fun <laughs> to get it done in 24 hours. <laughs> Maybe you should try searching it by the, the name and stuff that might. Yeah, that might I'm going to. That's yeah, such a useful uh, tool there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I mean, I get emails every few weeks from, you know, random composers who I've never met that just say, oh, you know, how do you find your poem? Or that poem is really cool. Where did you find it? And so some of it is um, searching these databases of, of poems. Um, I have subscriptions to poetry magazines. Um, and I'm, I mean, I love reading poetry. It's one of my hobbies. So I'm always at publisher websites and reading and, and going to used bookstores and buying tons and tons of poetry books. And that's the, that's a cool part of, of being a composer is you can collaborate with this other art form and join it together and create something cool. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Um, well, we'd love to um, finish off um, our topics with, uh, this is one of our favorite questions. We love to ask this of all of our guests. Um, okay. What is your why? Why do you compose? Why do you get up every morning and do what you do and teach young composers? What's the why? Uh, there's nothing else that I would want to do with my day. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's in my DNA is to compose and to create. And I mentioned earlier, but it's how I make sense of what I'm supposed to be doing and how I go about whatever, even when, when life is great, how I capture that joy and put it into music. And uh, if it's not going so great or it's stressful, how I can work my emotions out through that way. So that's the why there's nothing else. There's nothing else I'd want to do, but I don't think there's anything else I could do. It's just, I have to do it. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful that I'm in the, the, the position now that I can mentor others and I can help other composers create and find that thrill of inspiration and then they get to chase that as well wow that's a great why yeah i think that's the best part of making music in any way is sharing it with others absolutely yes mm -hmm. um well matthew if you have a, a few extra minutes we'd love to finish off with a rapid fire round yeah no, let's go for it destroying my house in the process i almost knocked <laughs> my lamp over oh my life flashed before my eyes all right, we got our multiple questions. questions. You go ahead, my dear. Okay. okay. Oh no, I use sticky notes to all stuff to each other. <laughs> okay. Matthew, where in the world would you travel right now? Fogo Island. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. What is the best advice you were ever given? Um, write music that you believe in. Okay. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is the most recent thing you have learned? Um, I'm reading a lot about deconstruction um, by Jacques Derrida is a philosopher so i'll say that um i'm learning about yeah philosophy right now and deconstruction how you take things apart to see um inherent biases and hierarchies and 
Um, that stem, yeah, it, it, it stemmed from reading books um, on decolonization and specifically in composition to see the ways in which we can work towards that. And then that stemmed to this idea of deconstruction, deconstructionism, and then that, that, that philosopher is Jacques Derrida. So that's what I'm really learning about this week. <laughs> Cool. Okay. That was really interesting. Huh. I'm going to have to find that. I'll put it in my brain. Okay. Well, you kind of already answered this, but there, there has to be another one. Do you have any interesting hobbies other than reading poetry? <laughs> um, well, I've really gotten into grooming my dog. Um, oh. Yeah. But he's a Bedlington Terrier. You can Google them um, or you can follow him on Instagram. His name's Bamboo, B-A-M-B-U. Um, and he looks, they look like lambs. Um, so they're super cute, but they require a lot of grooming and they don't shed. So you have to like oh. keep, keep on top of their maintenance. Um, so that's a hobby. And then, yeah, I really like art history and learning about mm -hmm. Me too. Um, yeah, how, how the art world is connected and then how that parallels or doesn't parallel to the musical side of things. Hmm. That's so cool. Also Those are two very different hobbies. <laughs> Dog grooming is great because it saves you some good money. It does. Yeah. Um, what composer would you like to speak to from any era? Um, Arvo Parrot. Hmm. He's still alive, so maybe I'll get a chance. Um, Arvo Parrot, um, he was the first composer that changed the way I thought about music. Um, in high school, I was listening to Mozart and Bach and Beethoven because uh, I knew I wanted to be in music. I thought, okay, I better stop listening to whatever pop music. Um, and I, I should start listening to Mozart and things. And that was okay. But then I came across Arvo Parrot and it changed everything about, well, changed everything. He was the composer that yeah, changed the way I viewed everything. And my life was totally different from, from that day on. So mm -hmm. I'd like to tell him that. Um, but I'd like to meet him too. Maybe this will hook you guys up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go, Arvo. Hopefully, he's tuning in. Yeah. That would be so cool. I don't know if he has. Uh, they have an Instagram page, so maybe I can at them and see. There we go. Oh, yeah, send a little message. We talked about you. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, don't worry. Yeah. Thing. Because every little thing. No, no. Yeah. That was embarrassing. Um, what is your happy place? <laughs> um, I'm most happy uh, when I'm doing music. So whether I'm composing, whether I'm at a choir or concert or rehearsal, or whether I'm just sitting here, you know, looking at a score, seeing the way the music is put together. Um, so anything, anything that where music is coming in and out of my DNA um, as my happy spot. Amazing. You're here. That's my last one. Okay. okay, if you weren't composing and teaching, what would you be or do? Growing up, I always put, I wanted to be a painter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'd change that now. I'd want to be a photographer. Oh. It's a similar idea. Um, but yeah, so another creative job. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you are so artistic. Every single answer, there's art involved. It's amazing. Always. I love it. Um, all right, last one is going to be, um, do you eat bagels? And if so, how do, oh. you, uh, how do you top your bagel? Uh, plain with butter. <gasps> Our first butter. <laughs> what else would you put on it? Cream cheese toppings. Oh, mm -mm. no. Okay, I see. I see. I do love a good like cheese bagel and butter. Mm. Delicious. That's cool. so funny. Matthew, thank you so much for doing this with us. It's been a total pleasure of ours to to host you on this podcast and learn all about uh, your process as a composer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and uh, for sharing this time with all of you. I'm grateful. Thank you. We are too. Thank you. Will it bring something to my house?
Who is this? I think it's my socks. <gasps> you ordered socks? I I really needed new socks. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go get them. I'm gonna go get my socks. Okay. Okay. I mean, when you see this later, I love you so much.